Uh, okay, ma'am, you can uh, start. All right. So, good evening, everyone. Um, all the guests who are here from Mumbai. Um, and good morning to you, Jayadeep, sir. It's, uh, my name is Sharmishtha Khan. On behalf of uh, Science Department, Muktangan, I'd like to welcome you all. And yes. the Space Geeks, uh, Chintavani, Vaibha, Vankush, Shineva, sir. Uh, good evening and welcome. Um, so Dr. Mukherjee, uh, uh, you have visited us twice before in our Elphinstown School. And uh, we know that everybody likes your talk so much. I mean, it's so informative and so much of learning, not only for the students, even for us all. So we are super excited. So without wasting any more time, I'll just um, I'll request uh, Mr. Chintamani, could you please say a few words and a big thank you to you. And welcome again, and good morning, Dr. Mukherjee. Thank uh, you. Good morning, good, good evening, everyone, and good morning to uh, Dr. Jaideep, sir. And uh, sir, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. And uh, as uh, Sharmishta ma'am said that uh, you have been visiting mm -hmm. Muktangan and we have been having this uh, space talk series, uh, which we are even continuing during pandemic. It's just that now we are going virtual. And uh, to start with uh, Space Geeks, uh, I'm a co-founder co at Space Geeks and uh, I'm myself a researcher working in the field of photonics and magnetism. And we also have other co-founder, Dr. Ankush Baskar, who is joining us from Kerala. He's right now at VSSC ISRO uh, as Inspire faculty. And uh, we also have uh, Dr. Virendra Yadav, uh, who is right now at Aries Nainital. He's working there as outreach scientist. And we also have our other colleagues, Dr. Uh, Vaibhav Raut, uh, who is working in high energy physics. And we have uh, Hari Tejas Ayer, who is working in plasma physics and uh, the experts associated with space geeks. Uh, and also have other teachers from Muktangan, and I specially thank uh, Mr. Valentine and Ms. Michelle for uh, making this event happen. And also I thank uh, trustee uh, Sunil Mehta sir, uh, who has been a great support to initiate these activities in collaboration with Muktangan. And we look forward in future that we initiate more projects in Muktangan related with space and we are keen that students will get some training, hands-on training, which will enable them to uh, look at, you know, tap future opportunities in the field of space. And as you all know that space is very exciting domain and it is a global domain and it's very much interdisciplinary field. And if someone asks, if someone asks you how you are connected with space, but uh, they never know how most of the technological things around us, how they actually emerged from space technology. And that is why we are here to talk about the opportunities which are present in the space sector. And when I say space sector, it is not just a technology sector, but there are even sectors like arts, law, psychology, everything is associated with space. And that is why we have here Dr. Jaideep Mukherjee who will take us to the journey of space opportunities present in the space sector. And why are we, man, human race, mankind, we are looking for space exploration. So with that, uh, without taking much of your time, uh, I will uh, request Dr. Vaibhav Rao to officially introduce uh, Dr. Jaideep Mukherjee for today's event. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chintamani. It is uh, indeed a great pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Jaideep Mukherjee, sir. Sir, uh, uh, so Dr. Jaideep Mukherjee is a director of the NASA Florida Space Grant Consortium. Uh, Florida Space Grant Consortium supports the expansion and diversifications of Florida's space industry through providing grants, scholarships, and fellowships to students and educators from Florida's public and private institutes of higher education. Dr. Jaideep Mukherjee received his bachelor's degree in physics uh, 
from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, and master's degree in physics from Mumbai University, India, and his MS and PhD degree in astronomy from University of Florida. He was the administrator of NASA Florida Space Grand Consortium, FSGC, at the University of Florida and later the director of NASA FSGC at the University of Central Florida, located at the Kennedy Space Center. He was also the director of the Florida Space Institute from 2006-2011. He served as the chair of Southeast Regional Space Grant com comprising of 10 Southeast states from 2006 to 2014. He was a member of the board directors of the National Space Grant Foundation from 2006 to 2008 and from 2012 to 2013. Currently, he is serving on the board of directors of National Space Grant Alliance and is a member of Commercial Space Operation Advisory Panel at the Embry Riedel Aeronautical University. In 2011, the National Education Society of India presented him with the 2011 National Eminence Award. In 1993, he was also awarded the Carrick Prize by the Astronomy Department at the University of Florida for the commitment to the education of the public and to the understanding of astronomy. He has published one book titled Close Binary Stars, a pictorial atlas along with co-authors Dr. Robert Wilson and Dr. Dirk Terrell. His main interest is in close binary stars and science, technology, engineering, mathematics, education. His research interests include synthesis of observable quantities for inter interacting binaries understanding binary stars, mass transfer, mass loss, and formation of particularly interesting or unusual closed binary stars. Dr. Mukherjee's personal interests include following the sports of cricket worldwide, and he was an avid cricket and tennis player during his college days and university days. It is indeed a great pleasure to have Dr. Mukherjee along with us, and I invite Dr. Mukherjee to give a talk titled the future of space explorations and career opportunity for students. Thank you, okay. uh, sir. Th thank you very much for everyone for inviting me. Um, can I share my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, okay, do you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. A lot of yes. Thank you. Yes. Well, good evening yes. to all, all, all the students in Mumbai. Yes. Um, first good of all, thank you for taking the time. Good evening. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So thank you for taking the time to, to sit and listen to this uh, presentation. And I think all of you who have joined in have taken the first step in, in being a very successful person. Um, because I've, I've noticed students who, who do take part in these activities, apart from just sitting at home and studying, are the ones who really make a contribution to society later on. So I think you've already taken the first step. So what I'm gonna to talk to you today is, is why we want to explore a space and how do you, how are you going to do it? And then in the end, I'm going to talk about some of the careers that you can do um, um, by, by going to, um, through space exploration. And as Tintamani said, you know, space is very varied. It is not just you know, astronomy or engineering. It could be space law, it could be space medicine and so on. So today's talk, I'm going to, you know, space exploration is so big that I can't talk about everything going on in, in the world. My focus is going to be basic, basically um, focused on what NASA is doing because that's what I'm more familiar with. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, especially what we're trying to do to train our astronauts um, and engineers so that we can have settlements on other parts of our solar system like the moon and Mars. So that's what I'll focus on today. Uh, and hopefully you'll get an idea of what the world is planning to do in the next 10, 15 years so that we can go to the moon or go to Mars 
um, and settle down eventually later on. So I'm going to talk, start with this slide. This is especially for all the students out there. Sally Ride was the, is the first uh, woman uh, teacher who was an astronaut. And she said that our future lies with today's kids and tomorrow's space exploration. And that's very true. So the future lies with what you are doing and what you plan to do in the next 10, 10 years. And we also know that a future is in space exploration. Um, uh, we still need to explore the ocean, but I think space exploration is, is the next step to take. So I we'll, always start with one slide, which kind of tells us where we are and how insignificant we are. So think about it this way. You think about it that you are actually on a spaceship, which we call Earth. And that spaceship is about four and a half billion years old. The spaceship is very complex. It's organic. When I say organic means it has, you know, we have this carbon molecules, which um, is the uh, basic ingredient for life, as we know, on the earth. And it's self-sufficient. Right now we are self-sufficient because we have enough fuel, water to, to, self, to survive. But I think in the future, we have to worry about whether can we be self-sufficient or do we need to go somewhere else? So our spaceship is orbiting another power source and we call the power source the sun. This power source is a million times bigger than, than, than our spaceship. Um, there are 200 billion such power sources uh, in my group, which we call the Milky Way galaxy. So a Milky Way galaxy has about 200 billion stars like the sun. Some of the stars are larger than the sun, some are smaller than the sun. And believe it or not, we think that just in the Milky Way galaxy, there are more than, at least we know, at least there are more than five to 10 billion planets. That's a very low number. I'm sure it's more than that. So we are, our Milky Way galaxy is in a group of about 40 more galaxies. Um, and then this 40 galaxies is in a, in a universe which has about, uh, about 200 billion galaxies. So just imagine how insignificant we, we are. And just to give you an idea, next time you go to, to a beach, just start counting the grains of sand. Take some grains of sand in your hand, start counting it. Then all the stars in the universe is greater than all the grains of sand in all the beaches in the world. Think about that. There are so many stars in our, galaxy, in our universe itself. So, what I wanted to tell you is welcome to life. It's more exciting when you think it on a larger scale. When you go back and you think where you are in comparison to your universe, you'll see how small and insignificant we are. So the question that I always get, you know, and I'm sure you'll be getting it too when you talk about exploration is why do we explore? Especially the especially space. Well, for one, we want to protect and understand the world. Right, we want to know what's happening with our with our atmosphere, you know, the ozone hole, our climate change. That's in, important. Second is ex inspiration, and that's where you guys come in. Our job, our teacher's job, is to inspire you so that you can do and do the exploration when you grow up and when you go to college and become scientists or engineers or anything else. The third thing is because of space exploration, we have new technology. And I'll show you a slide on that. Um, answering unknown questions. I think one of the hallmark of being a human being is that we quest for knowledge. Once we stop that quest for knowledge, we are gone as a civilization. So we have to, we always want to answer unknown questions. And that's, we, try, we pose the questions, we try to answer them. It is in every human being in one way or the other. International collaboration, you're seeing that a lot now with the International Space Station, a lot of countries working together because it is very expensive to, to expose space. And finally, and I think this is very important, is the long time survival of the species, of the human species. Um, you know, asteroids have been bombarding Earth on a small scale, but every, every few million years, 
there is a, a big asteroid or an, or an object which comes and hits the Earth. Um, and we have to worry about that. So um, apart from the fact that, you know, you have to worry about asteroids hitting Earth, we might have a shortage of fuel, shortage of food. So we have to figure out a way, can we go and settle on other planets or other objects in our solar system? So long, long time survival is very important. And if you just look at all the species that have ever lived on the earth in the past 4 billion years, 99.9% .9 of the species are extinct. And that's sad. A lot of the species that we knew are all gone, very little left. And the type, typical lifespan of a species is about 10 million years, which is very small compared to geological time scales it could be billions of years. And on the earth, extinction is a rule, survival is the exception. So remember that. The reason we have survived as humans is because we have the technology, we have the knowledge to survive. But actually it's extinction. That's the rule on the earth. That's why 99.9% .9 of the species are, are extinct. And then another thing and the problem that the downside of scientific advance, advancement is the risk of human extinction as we use scientific knowledge in the wrong way, whether it's biological warfare, chemical warfare, nuclear warfare, anything. So that's, but I think that is, that is not so much of a problem as, as much as people tend to think, um, but it can cause a problem, it can. So that's something to think about. So, because of all these reasons, I think a lot of people think is that we need to start thinking of trying to settle on other objects in a solar system. Not, not take the whole Earth's population and go there, but just figure out a way that can we have some settlement on the moon, some on Mars, some on an asteroid, or on space stations. And we are doing that. Here's a quote by Stephen Hawking. It says, to confine our attention to terrestrial matters would be to limit the human spirit. And I'm not saying don't worry about what's going on on the earth. We have to worry about that. That's very important. We have poverty, um, we have inequality. We worry about that. But at the same time, we also try to figure out a way to, um, to do other things that is important for the long time survival of a species. And Chintamani had talked about uh, benefits of space exploration and the technology. I'm giving you like a very, very small snapshot, like 1%. So the digital cell phone technology that we're using right now is because of space technology. The pacemakers which people use instead of a heart is space technology. Um, GPS, you know, you all use a phone, whether it's an iPhone or an Android phone, and they all have GPS. That's all a result of space technology. Uh, Velcro is space technology, hip replacement, uh, insulation fabric, hearing aid, uh, your lenses, your glasses, polaroid glasses, all of them came because we were trying to figure out how we can survive in space. And this is, this is a snapshot, but what I want to get into uh, uh, for you to understand is that space exploration is not just exploring space, but we get the technology, we spin off the technology, we give it to small companies, and they come up with all these products that we use in our everyday life. So when someone says, why are we spending so much money on space? I would say, if that's what you think, stop using your phone, stop flying, don't go to a doctor, and so on and on. And we spend very little on space exploration compared to making a movie or so on. It's nothing. So I'm going to talk to you quickly about two or three slides what NASA has been doing in terms of space exploration. And I'm only talking about the science part of NASA. I'm not talking about the space shuttles of all the other missions. So if you just follow, look out here on the missions, there are already 105 missions in the form of satellites, either around the earth, all around the sun, or other planets, the 105 of them. Um, there are about, 38 science missions and rockets. And here's the interesting thing. Um, there are 47 science missions, what is called CubeSats. CubeSats are small satellites 
about 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeters. And even middle school students are building CubeSats. I know you, all of you, have the capability to build a CubeSat. You just need the opportunity. Okay. Um, so, and um, as you see, um, NASA gives about six hundred million dollars uh, to scientists and to students and to faculty in universities for space research. There's a lot of investment by by the U.S. government through NASA for uh, space research. This is an idea. This is so much to see, and, you, and the idea is not for you to count every satellite going around the different parts, but just to give you an idea that we have a number of satellites, NASA satellites, and European and Indian satellites going either way around the Earth or Mars or the Moon or other planets. And I'll talk to you each by each very quickly, very briefly, because I don't have time for all of that. So, astrophysics. So we have a number of satellites that are actually looking at our galaxy, our universe, and so on. Um, the ones in orange are being, uh, are, are being implemented right now. The one in green are already in operation. But the ones in yellow that you see, like Sphere X, W first, uh, uh, James Webb, where is James Webb? These are the ones that are, going to, are being formulated, are being implemented right now. There are a number of them that are actually studying our universe. Where did we come from? So the next big, I think the next big satellite, the big, big spacecraft or telescope is called the James Webb Telescope. This, this is a model of the James Webb Telescope and it shows how big it is compared to humans. It's a large telescope. Um, it's mostly looking at the infrared, which is the heat coming from objects. And so very interesting, place that this satellite is going to be once it's launched in a year or so. It is not going to orbit the Earth directly like the Hubble does. So if you look at this image out here, the Hubble telescope is actually orbiting the Earth by going back, looking back to space. But the James Webb telescope will be at a distance of about 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth, behind the moon, in a position called the Lagrangian point. That is a point in space where the gravity of the moon and the earth balance each other. So you put a spacecraft exactly at this point, it'll just go around that point. Um, and the reason we have it over here and not around the earth, because this web telescope is what is called an infrared telescope. It is going to, observe, it's going to study the heat coming from planets, from newborn stars, old galaxies, and so on. And if you have heat, then if you have the light from the earth or the heat from the earth on the moon, that might cause an interference on the satellite. So they're putting the satellite in the shadow of the earth and the moon far away from them so that the heat from the earth and the moon will not cause any problems with the satellite. So that's a very interesting place to put a satellite. It will be launched in a year or so. And this, this uh, diagram uh, animation shows you the orbit of this web satellite, as the Earth goes around the sun, it's going to go around, it's exaggerated a bit, but it's going to go around this L2 point, and this L2 point is always behind the Earth. So it's in the shadow of the Earth as compared to the sun, and it avoids this direct sunlight. So that's going to be the orbit of the satellite as it, uh, when it's launched. And what are we going to study? We're going to study the time, um, you know, the universe formed, what we call the Big Bang, the first galaxies, how the galaxies like our Milky Way evolved, how stars form, how planets form, and then how life evolved on the Earth. So once this launch, a telescope is, sat, uh, is launched, there are so many things that we'll learn. Um, the textbooks will change, I promise you that, once the satellite is launched. So that's coming up in a year or so. Um, this is the planetary science mission. These are all the um, missions around other planets, whether it's uh, uh, Mars or Jupiter or Saturn or Neptune and so on. There are so many of them. Um, if you look around the moon, there are so many of them uh, going around the moon. Um, there are two of them that are going to actually land uh, soon. On Mars, there are a number of uh, satellites uh, going around Mars. And this is a NASA image, so it does not show uh, the, the moon, the, the um, um, the Indian satellite going around the moon. But the next slide I'm going to talk to you about 
perseverance in just one slide because you know it take an hours to go about this topic itself but um in about uh, 18 days i think right today is the thing about 19 days uh, there will be a spacecraft going to mars called 2020 and it's going to drop us a small um a rover um onto the onto the mars and it's going to land on a crater called the Jezero crater. It's very, it's a very interesting crater. I would say it's about um, four or five times the size of the lunar crater in, in Maharashtra, uh, about five times the size. Uh, it's a dry bed, but we think that there was water there in the past because we have seen um, like a delta. You know, when a river comes near an ocean or a lake, it forms this delta. Um, streams of other um, of, of rivers. And that's what we have seen uh, near this crater. So we think that if we go to this crater and we can scoop up material and analyze it for the science of uh, bacterial life form, we might be successful. So that's why this is very interesting. This is going to go and land there. It's going to scoop up material, study that. And also they're going to take the material, keep it aside for future missions to go to Mars and bring it back um, bring it back to the Earth. And the interesting thing about this mission, and you've all heard about this, is the helicopter. Um, remember, on the Earth, you have a lot of atmosphere, so it's very easy for a helicopter to, to move around. On Mars, the atmosphere is very, very thin. So the helicopter has to be built very differently. And I think this, yeah, this is the Mars helicopter technology demonstration. It's just to demonstrate that the helicopter can work in the Martian atmosphere. So the helicopter will be inside the rover. Um, and when the rover lands onto the moon, um, the, um, the helicopter will move away from the rover and then it's going to do the flight. But it'd be so interesting because if you have the helicopters working properly in the future, it can take the place of rovers, you know, and it can go very quickly to different parts of Mars um, um, take images, send it back to the rover itself. So that's the idea behind it is to have a helicopter on Mars, a small one, which will fly around um, just above the surface and take images of the surface, send it back to the rover. So when the rover goes to that place, it knows where the boulders are, where rocks are and so on. So again, technology, you know, Everything that we do uh, in NASA and ISRO and everything is actually driven by science. We have a reason to go, but a lot of the work are done by the engineers, you know, whether they're electrical or computer science or aerospace, they are the ones who do most of the work. Um, so where is uh, the, the, the name of the rover is Perseverance. And this was actually, uh, I took the snapshot about 20 minutes ago. So it's about, um, traveled about 270 um, forget mile, million miles right now. It's very close to, um, to Mars. Uh, about 92% of the trip has been completed. And look at its speed. Relative to the sun, it's about 49,000 miles per hour. And this is the actual video of what's going to happen in animation of the uh, arrival of Perseverance at Mars in about 19 days. And you can all watch it live on, on YouTube, on the NASA TV and so on. So there'll be, a, there'll be a, the space, the rover will drop from the satellite in a parachute. And then just before it lands, uh, the rover will drop from the uh, lander. It will have its own rocket so it can slowly um, move down. So that will be the rover called Perseverance. It, ha it has a lot of cameras, experiments, um, the, the, the helicopter. But uh, in a June, June on, on uh, February 18th, um, I don't know exactly what time, but uh, you can always check that and, and, and check it out. Next thing is the sun. There are a number of satellites actually studying the sun. It's very important we understand the sun because it affects our atmosphere. Uh, and um, you want to understand the effect of what you call the solar wind or the charged particles from the sun, which comes in hit our atmosphere. So the number of, you know, there are some of them that are actually orbiting the sun, 
like the Parker Solar Probe, the Solar Orbiter, the Sun going around the Earth to study the effects of the Sun onto the uh, onto the uh, Earth's atmosphere. And just want to give a shout out to Gold. The Gold mission was actually built by uh, not built, but it was managed by an institute called the Florida Space Institute, where I am, um, and they managed and uh, they did the whole program, the whole satellite. It was launched about two years ago, and it's actually, um, and you have a lot of students working on the satellite, including Indian students who worked on the satellite. Um, uh, and then it was launched about two years ago. Right now, we're studying the Earth's ionosphere to see what happens to the ionosphere when solar winds come and hit the sun. So this is personal, like I've been involved, not directly, but when I was the director of the Institute, we got the award was about $50 million to build this satellite. And then of course the earth, we are not forgetting the earth. And there are so many satellites going around the earth to study what's going on with the earth itself. So just to give you an idea, there are so many objects, things are going around in our, um, around, around the world uh, and other, other satellites and other moons. But I want to focus on two objects. One is called the low earth orbit where we have the space station and the other is the moon. Because I think once we understand how we can survive under conditions of microgravity and on the moon, it's only then that we can go to Mars or we can go to other asteroids. And because the low Earth orbit is about 2000 kilometers above the Earth's surface and the moon is very close to us, we can do quick studies on these areas before we go to Mars, which is a minimum of six months journey. So I'm going to focus on these two. And here's the idea, exploring what you want to do is, you want to study the space station right here and to see how we can um, uh, survive under conditions of microgravity or weightlessness. Then we go to the moon and figure out how we can settle on the moon, how we can survive on the moon. And then after that, we try to go to Mars. So I know that a lot of you know, ideas come in, we're going to Mars right now. I believe it'll take some time. Uh, SpaceX is planning to go to Mars very quickly but there are a lot of other problems on going to Mars right now. So we have landed on a number of extraterrestrial bodies. We have landed on Mercury. Actually, we have crash landed on Mercury, not directly landed. We have landed on, on Venus, we have landed on Mars. We have landed on Jupiter, the Juno spacecraft. Um, we have landed on the moon. Uh, we landed on Titan, which is one of the moons of Saturn, uh, on comets, on asteroids, um, uh, the Cassini spacecraft actually uh, crash landed on Saturn. And there is one which uh, just about a month ago picked up some material from the asteroid Bennu and we bring it back to the Earth and so on. So we have landed, robotic landing, except for the moon where humans have landed. We have landed in all these areas in our, in our solar system. I'll skip this one. So this is what we plan to do in the next, in the next few years. Explore the solar, explore the low Earth orbit, go to the moon, and then to Mars, and, and then to Jupiter, and so on. So let's quickly look at the low Earth orbit. And this is the diagram of the all the satellites which are around the Earth. There are too many of them. Some of them are actually satellites. Some of them are debris when satellites have collided. Um, and there are more than 9,000 such objects, or more than that around the earth and we have to track every one of them because you have the space station, we have other, other major satellites and if any of this debris come close to the satellite and hits it, it will damage the satellite or the space station. So this is an exaggeration, uh, an artist's conception, but gives you an idea how cluttered the earth is, or, uh, the orbit around the earth with all these satellites and debris. And when I, call, when I say low Earth orbit, I'm talking about about 2,000 kilometers maximum above the Earth's surface. The uh, satellites, which gives us TV uh, broadcasts and everything, they're called geostationary uh, satellites. And they are about 35,000 kilometers above the Earth. So we are focusing very, very, uh, very near the Earth, about 1,000 um, kilometers to about 2,000 kilometers. And that's where we have the International Space Station. So quickly talk about the International Space Station because that's where we can do all our research about weightlessness. 
because anytime we go beyond the earth, gravity becomes smaller. And then in some places almost uh, we, are, we experience weightlessness and things work very differently when we call it microgravity, where the gravity is very small compared to the earth. Things work very differently. So we need to figure out how we can survive in such a condition before we go and live on the moon or on Mars and so on. So that's why the International Space Station was built. It's a very big spacecraft. It's orbiting the Earth. And I would say it's about the size of, say, Wonkati Stadium or, or, or Braven Stadium. It's like the size of a, of a cricket field. Uh, may not be as round, but it's more rectangular. So that's the size of it. And um, it's the most complex engineering project in history. Um, it's the largest structure we have put in space and gives you an idea. A space shuttle is actually quite smaller than the uh, a Boeing 747. But look how big the International Space Station is. Um, it's pretty big. So why, why we have the ISS? Because it serves as a microgravity. Microgravity means uh, less gravity as compared to the Earth uh, and weightlessness. And we can do a number of experiments in biology, physics, astronomy, and so on. And I'll talk to you briefly about them. Um, a number of countries are involved. Uh, uh, unfortunately, India is not a part of them, but India has taken part in experiments on the space station. So the space station flies at about uh, 400 kilometers above the Earth. It's not that far away. Um, look at this. This is very interesting. It actually goes around the Earth 90 minutes. Every 90 minutes, it, it takes 90 minutes to make one orbit around the Earth. So you know what that means? It means that if you are on the space station, you will experience 15 sunrises and 15 sunsets every day. As humans on the earth, we see one sunrise and one sunset. But on the, um, um, on the International Space Station, we have so many sunrises and sunsets. So uh, hopefully in the future, one of you might be, uh, be an astronaut orbiting the earth. And you might be able to see this um, sunrises and sunset. In fact, I can guarantee you, one of you will be doing it in front more. As you grow up and become a scientist or an engineer, there'll be a lot more opportunities to do these things. And I hope, and I really hope that one of you in this audience would be one of the astronauts going around the earth or going to the moon and so on. Um, um, let me just show this. Now I'll skip this because I don't think it's important. But this is what I want to explain to you. And because people misunderstand what we call um, microgravity or they call it zero gravity. There is always gravity unless you go way deep in space. Gravity always exists. As you go further away from the earth, the gravity decreases. The effect of the gravity decreases. But it doesn't mean it's not there. So when they say zero gravity, it's a wrong term to use. So what do we, so why do astronauts on the space station, on the space shuttle, why are they floating? It's not because there is no gravity. There is gravity, but it's something called weightlessness. And I hope to show it to you by this animation. So just imagine that you're on the space shuttle on your airplane about um, uh, say, I forget the number, it's, uh, it's about 400 miles or 600 kilometers above the earth. And you're right over there. And if you're not moving, if you're right over there because of gravity in about 360 seconds, you'll fall and hit the earth. But we know that the space shuttle or the space station is not hitting the earth, it is going around the earth. Why? Because we give it an initial speed of about 7,500 meters per second. You have to give it that speed. Once you give that speed, then what happens, look, in about three, it takes about 360 seconds to fall down, right? But if you give it that initial speed sideways, then look, it's going to go sideways and also fall down because of gravity. But it's never going to hit the Earth because it's moving sideways. So what is happening in reality is the space station or the space station is free falling towards the Earth, but it never hits the Earth because it has a sideways speed, a sideways velocity. So next time you're in an elevator and you, and you press the button to go up or to go down, you will feel the effects of weightlessness for a few seconds. 
Okay, and that's what they feel. They feel weightlessness because the space station is actually hurtling towards the Earth because of the Earth's gravity. But we give it a sideways speed, so it never hits the Earth. It goes round and round, and that's why they are floating in the space station, not because of there's no gravity. And here's the here's the problem because it's in the Earth's atmosphere. There is resistance, and because there is resistance, sometimes the um, uh, space station can come go up or come down a bit. And when it does that, we have other space scraps which are um, uh, docked to the space station, like the Russian one called Vesta, and they have their own small rocket. So they then fire the rockets, and that brings the space space, space station up or below um, the original orbit. So we require those things. Um, to move the space station, and the other one is is debris. There's a lot of debris going around the Earth, and if there's a debris which is coming towards the space station and attracting the debris, then we need to move the uh, space station above the path or below the path of the debris, and that's where these docking uh, space cups come in. So we move the space station up or down to avoid the debris. If you have seen the movie Gravity, you'll know what I'm saying. The next three minutes, I'd like to show this video footage because it shows what an astronaut sees from the space shuttle, from the space station. Um, there is some cinematic license, but in, in, but they're all made from actual videos are taken from the space station and they're sped up. So it's about 370 kilometers above the Earth. It's very expensive, $150 billion. It's a very expensive. But look, here's the spacecraft, and here are the solar panels, which gathers, generates electricity, and here's the Earth. Remember, we have sped up the film uh, because it takes a long time otherwise. So here's the space, here's the space station, and here's the uh, solar panels. And, you, and the reason you see it moving is because the space station is also moving. Here's a picture taken by a space shuttle which is going away from the space station. This is a Russian spacecraft docked to the space station. And you can see the Earth below us. See how blue it is. And that's because of the oceans. And you have the white clouds over here. But this is what the astronauts see. And if you ever talk to an astronaut, and I've spoken to a number of them, they say that every time they go up and they see Mother Earth, the life changes. It's a very different perspective. And look, this is what the Earth looks like from, from, from 370 kilometers. A lot of clouds. These are cyclone hurricanes. Um, again, they're taking a number of video clips and put it together. Now, this is the dark side. This, this flashes that you see are actually lightning storms. And these are city lights. So these are lightning storms. The thin layer that you see is the Earth's atmosphere. That's what is saving us from the dangerous radiation from outer space. Um, this is just an artist's conception of a comet. But this is, this is the actual night sky. If you can take a picture, not with your eyes, but with the camera. Again, we are going over the Earth, speeding up, speeding up the film. These are called the northern lights, the green flashes that you see. Aurora Borealis, we cannot see from India. But this is what the Earth looks like um, from the space station and the sky. This is called the Capola. It's like a viewing station on the space station. And you can look through the window, take the movies, take pictures. And the astronauts spend a lot of time over there. So these are the northern lights called the Aurora Borealis, which, which is beautiful as seen from the, from, from the space station. This is Florida. This is Washington, D.C. over here, east coast of the United States. And so I'm going to skip uh, on because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, here's India and Sri Lanka as seen from the space station. This is just a picture. You can barely see Mumbai over here. Um, this is a clip, a very short clip of some of the cities 
this is Bengaluru as seen from the space station in the night. So you have all these lights everywhere. Um, um, this is actually New Delhi. Um, here's the Yamuna River, Jamuna River. And there are some places like the Rashtrapati Bhavan, the temple, the India Gate. Um, this is uh, Mumbai, as seen from space. Um, this is the Marine Drive over here, Gateway of India, Worldly Sea Face over here, Wonkhede Stadium over here, and so on. This is the airport over here. So that's Mumbai as seen from space, just to give you an idea of what India looks like from space. So um, I'm going to skip this. Here's uh, living on the space station. Um, it's very cramped. It's like a four or five bedroom house with six people living on it. Uh, here's the crew compartment. Um, this is where they make the food. Uh, the toilet is at the back. Here's, again, because it's weightlessness, if you keep fruits, they'll be, they'll be floating around. So you have to always strap them. Here they're trying to make um, some breakfast or lunch. Um, you can see mayonnaise over here, so making a sandwich. Again, because of weightlessness, you know, if you, if you don't tie your hair, it'll be all over the place. Just, just what they're trying to demonstrate that. Um, I said, very cramped quarters. So this, this is the sleeping quarters. They all sleep in kind of sleeping bags right here. That's how you sleep. So if you're claustrophobic, you cannot be an astronaut right now. Um, but it's not, not very comfortable living over there. This is what I said called the cupola. It's like a, a observation window. And that's where they take images like the ones that you saw uh, from the space station. Here's a famous toilet. Uh, this is a very expensive piece of equipment because uh, you have to be very careful what you do. It's, it's it's um, uh, weightlessness, right? So you have to really strap yourself down um, um, to, to, to clear your bodily fluids. Um, and then you have actually um, um, funnels, uh, different funnels for men and women um, um, to, to gather the bodily fluids. And if you're not very careful, then you know the, uh, the bodily fluids can spatter around. And there is a bad smell near the toilet, I've been told by astronauts. Um, but uh, most of them, this is all vacuum, so it's very expensive. The new toilet that NASA has built for the future missions to the moon, it costs $2.6 million. Um, you can convert it to rupees, multiply by 70 rupees. But it's very expensive because you have to be able to uh, have, uh, have a vacuum system but the very interesting thing, and you might hate it, but the urine and the sweat that they collect is converted to water. And the next animation will show you how it is done it, how it is done. Because it is very expensive to carry water to the space station. Uh, more water you carry, the more, power, the more heavy the, the rocket becomes, you need more fuel becomes more expensive. So you have to figure out a way to actually um, have water and here it is. This is an animation of how, how um, the astronauts use the bathroom. So when they go to the bathroom, uh, the urine is collected and pumped to what is called a distillation assembly, like a centrifuge It goes round and round. And what it does, it actually uh, collects the solids to one side and the water is evaporated and condensed in another chamber. And about 85% of the urine can be recovered as water. Then the water is pumped to a tank and it's mixed with the water that they get from the sweat and respiration um, from the, the space station. And then they remove all the uh, gases from the liquid. And so on. So they, the, the, the thing is that you have to do this, but the water that they get out of it is very, very pure. And I bet you that is going to be purer than the water you drink in Mumbai. It looks, it sounds awful um, that you're drinking water made out of urine, um, extracted from the urine, but it's, it's perfectly okay. Um, but they do a number of checks to see that the water is. So um, in one year, they had made actually 3,600 liters of water from the urine. Uh, and you didn't have to carry it from the space station. 
So here's um, uh, living on the space station. Uh, so there you go. Weightlessness. You always have to exercise because if you don't exercise, then um, you lose what you call a body mass. Your bones become very brittle. And once you come back to the earth, you're finished. Um, but because of the weightlessness, you can move things very easily. These are heavy suitcases or boxes that the astronauts are moving around. Um, it's very simple to use. You can also hum move a human person. This is actually a video. So they, uh, it's very easy to move around and move heavy objects. Of course, you don't have showers because water will fly all over. So to take a shower, you use a bottle like the one they're using out here and spray yourself and then clean yourself. Um, as you see, there's the razor uh, moving around. Water, if water is spilled, it forms a spherical bubble and you can drink from there. This is life on the space station. It's very exciting. Uh, and I hope that one of you, as you grow up, can uh, be on the space station or on some other orbiting space station. This is, um, as I said, you have to be in a, like a sleeping bag to sleep. It's very, very uncomfortable. So that is on these, that is the uh, life on the space station. Um, and we're doing a lot of research. As you see, India is also one of the countries that have done research on the space station, both educational activities and research. About 83 countries have been working on them. And I'm going to skip some slides um, just to um, show you what is being done. And one of the most interesting thing, I, I think, especially if you want to study medicine, is how we can create new drugs to cure cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and so on. So but the thing is that protein is one of the major nutrients that we have, along with fats and carbohydrates. And um, for example, hemoglobin is a protein which carries oxygen in our blood. Now, what happens is that um, if you take one of these protein crystal and you magnify it, you'll find that there are places in this crystal where enzymes come out, which causes the disease. Now, if you can block that um, enzyme, block that hole with, with some kind of a, kind of a, um, a drug, then uh, you can cure the disease. But on the space station, you can form very pure crystal than on the Earth. Look how, clear, how clearer it is. More clear, clearer these, uh, the uh, crystal is, the better you can figure out a place where the enzymes are secreted, which causes the, which causes the disease. Then the drug companies can find a way of blocking uh, this hole. Um, and we call it like a keyhole. Um, and a key, this is the keyhole and a key which will actually uh, fit that keyhole. So drug company, once it knows how good a protein crystal looks like, then they are going to um, actually um, find a drug to fit that. And I'll skip some slides, but I'll show you. Um, of course, right now my computer is frozen. Hold on one second. One second. I apologize. My computer seemed to have frozen. Um, this is this is the wonders of technology. Hold on one second. In the meantime, if you have questions, just uh, someone will put in chat or, or you can answer, answer questions by the time I get this working. Yes. Uh, Michelle, there, are there some questions uh, we can take? Yes. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, there is a common question by many people um, to uh, for, uh, Dr. Jaydeep's uh, Mukherjee that um, how did your journey begin at NASA initially and what are the qualifications required to uh, join NASA? So this is okay. one common question. Yeah. Let me answer that quickly. Um, First of all, okay. to be to work for NASA directly, you have to be a US citizen. 
but there are so many ways with, to work with that. I don't know what's happening with this computer. Um, so um, what I did was I did my, my, I did my master's in Mumbai, then I wanted to study astronomy. So I did my master's in astrophysics uh, and PhD at the University of Florida. When I was there, one of my, my advisor, the one that was doing, he got a research grant from NASA and he took me into his research team and I was paid by NASA to do that research work. NASA allows that. Uh, if you're in a university, it doesn't matter which country you come from, you, you can do the work. Um, I'm sorry. I, yeah, sorry, Is someone asking sorry. a question? Sorry, no, no, no. It was just a noise, some background. Okay, noise. so, so, um, so that's how I started, and then, and then, um, 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 when this uh, position for the director of the space grant came about, um, they were um, I had to compete with other com other other people to uh, to get the directorship, and uh, all the universities in the state of Florida elected me. So that's how I became the director. But for students who want to work um, with NASA directly, uh, you cannot, you have to be a US citizen, but you can uh, work with, um, um, I don't want to actually try to reboot my computer because I lose. Um, so I don't know what's happening. Um, but you can, uh, you, can, you can work in universities. But what I tell students right now, ISRO is changing. Israel is changing so much right now that um, um, one thing. Um, one second. Let me just go and uh, try get my iPad done so I can do it. With that. Sure, sir. Oh no, get my iPad now. Um. So, oh, this computer is today has to I'm doing this every day. Um. So you do that now in, in India. They said you can. Um, I can't read over here. Um, in India, you can you can study uh, engineering, uh, sciences, uh, and so on. And ISRO has now become very open. Um, you don't have to work directly with ISRO, but there are other companies that you can work with um, um, in um, in um, uh, in India. Um, as I said, you can do sciences. You can do um, engineering and so on. So there are ways to work. Um, you just have to figure out. Uh, you have to be. You have to be excited to do that work, and uh, you you can do it. Any other question? Um, I'm trying to do my iPad, and then I'll yeah, uh, sure. reboot my computer. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, there's one interesting question by R V Singh. Uh, she has mentioned that is there any technology being made to clean up the space waste, the debris that's uh, in space? So I found um, that Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So right now, what, what, what at least in, in the US, if you ever launch a satellite, even a small satellite like a CubeSat, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, you have to have, um, you have to have, um, um, a plan to bring the satellite down, okay? But that's for the future. What's happening right now is that um, um, there are different plans that they're having to see how we can capture some of this debris. One of them is using a large net on the satellite. So there are, there are things that they're trying to do uh, to, um, um, uh, to figure out ways to capture the debris. Hold on one second. I'm trying to, I'll, I'll try to connect to my iPad and then. Um, yes, sir. Oh, you are inside the meeting now through iPad, I think. Yeah. Okay, so what I can do is I can reboot my computer in the meantime. Yeah, my computer is totally died out here. Hari, uh, Hari, uh, there are some questions on YouTube as well. Just keep note of those. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
Yes. Jaydeep sir, are you there? Hold on, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. So, let me ask my computer is rebooting, so in the meantime, I'll answer questions again. Um, right. What was yes. the second question? Michelle, uh, can we um, have more questions? Sir, a lot of students are asking question about black hole. Can they get collapsed? What happens when something gets in there? So could you please throw some light on it? Okay, that's that's um, um, so that's a different topic altogether. But bl black holes, um, you know, are are objects that uh, are so dense that even light cannot escape. And black holes are formed when certain stars, which are very more uh, powerful compared to the Earth. Um, uh, sorry, uh, very large compared to the sun. When the sun, when the stars die, they form what is called a black hole. It's actually, an object that is um, uh, so dense as I said, the light cannot escape at all. Um, so um, we think black holes do exist because we have evidence, indirect evidence of black holes. We cannot see black holes directly because light cannot come through, but. If we have a black hole going around the star, and it's called a binary system, then the black hole actually uh, pulls material from the star. And we can see that uh, um, the effects of that uh, uh, gravity pulling that material from the star, and we know there is something like a black hole. We don't see it, but we see the effect of its gravity. So we think black holes do exist. But the problem is, is that a lot of people think that if you come if, you, if a black hole is near you, it will suck everything inside. And that's not true at all. Black holes, only when you come very, very close to a black hole, that you will be pulled inside. For example, and this can never happen, but just for example, if the sun suddenly become a black hole, then the Earth will have no problems at all. Of course, if the sun becomes a black hole, means there's no light, and then there'll be no life on Earth. But the Earth will not be pulled in. You have to come very close to a black hole to be pulled into a black hole. So, black holes are exciting objects. There's a lot of science fiction stories about, you know, the end. Once you enter a black hole, you have what is called a wormhole, and you can go from one part of the universe to another part of the universe through a wormhole. And theoretically, that can that do exist. So, black holes are interesting objects, but we don't have direct evidence for it. And then there are people I know, especially in India, there are people who think the black holes should be explained in some another way. Um, so the so black holes are interesting objects, but we don't know much about them. And maybe we are wrong about them for, you know. Uh, I think uh, uh, Srinivas sir is having a question regarding yeah. the satellite project. Srinivas sir, are you there? You can go ahead with your question. Hello, Srinivas sir, can you hear us? Let me just, let me just see if sir is there. Uh, I'll ask him to... He has already put his okay, question. Jaydeep, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. I can. Jaydeep, you deal in student satellite projects. I have just yeah. more questions. How do you find the response from India? Number two, how is that that majority of the student sat projects in India are from the south? Um, is that true? I think so. What is going to happen on February 28th, etc. Well, and, that, and that's because of uh, one person who's involved, right? And that person is in the South. <laughs> so, so that's, that's actually, that's what is the problem, is you need, you need someone who is um, uh, very uh, gung-ho about working with students. And that person, I think you're talking about Srimati, she is wonderful with students. She's in the South, she's in Chennai. And so she has been able to um, figure out a way to work with students. So it's just South, just because you, we can do it in Mumbai. Yeah. Um, we can talk about doing, doing, I know there's one school in my in Florida and I've been supporting them. You know, there are eight, there are eight standard students and they have launched a satellite, a CubeSat. Oh. Eight standard, no, between seven to eight. They have launched a satellite. So anyone can do. 
I'm 100% sure all the students that are listening right now can build a simple satellite and and um, and launch it. But my question, my thing is that you know you don't have to actually orbit the Earth to be a satellite. You can you can call it a payload, and you can put it on a on a on a on a weather balloon, or just there are a number of ways that we can do. Um, and I would I would really love to work with students in Mumbai. Um, the the, co- the the thing is is the expense, but I think ISRO is willing to um, launch satellite. Uh, satellite. So um, I think we can do it. it can be done. Uh, in the case in, in this country, there are a lot of opportunities for a uh, lot of opportunities for students. So um, uh, they um, I'm trying to just. So in, in this country, there are a lot of way of, of taking part in, uh, in satellite experiments. In fact, uh, over the last 10 years, I had my own satellite design competition. And I've started satellite clubs in a number of universities. So what I'll do is right now, I will again join um, through Zoom, through my computer. Um, and I'll keep, up, okay. I'll keep on answering questions. Go ahead. Anything else to me was, but but I think we can do it in we can do it in India in in, in Western India. It can be done. In fact, on the 28th, we are having the C-51 launch, which is a milestone launch because there are three satellites uh, for students. Right, right. But we can do it. It's, there's nothing to do with south uh, or east. Can uh, can you see? Uh, I yeah, want to one? ask one thing. Yeah. So, uh, if uh, now we are more dependent on the technology, so if in future there will be a space war, so is India ready to fight to face that situation? Is there any technology for that? I don't want, we shouldn't worry about that. But yes, I, I believe India has the technology to fight back. But, but I don't think it's going to happen. Okay? Those is just rhetoric that you get in newspapers and other people talking about. So yes, we have, in the US also we have created another branch of the military called the Space Force. But um, um, I don't think it's going to happen. But yes, India has a technology, um, but there's no need to use it because there will be no space war. And lots of people say, they will not be. Okay, thank you, sir. Is time travel possible? Time travel? Well, you know, yes. if you ask me, I don't think it's possible. But I know there are a lot of new ideas coming out about time travel. Um, I don't think it's possible. I don't think you can go back and forward in time because um, I believe there is this loop. Uh, if, if time travel was possible, we should have seen it, right? If someone came from the future, we should have seen it. If someone did come from the future and altered the present, that is going to alter the future also. So I don't believe that um, time travel is so easy to um, to do. But I know there are people who have uh, come out ways that they think that time travel is possible. What is the temperature in space? Very, very cold. Very, very, very cold. If I want to give you a number, it'd be you know, minus, minus some centigrade, minus 50, 100 degrees centigrade. Very, very cold. So may I ask one question? I have a question. So galaxy looks, looks stationary. So why do uh, scientists or researchers say that they rotate? Well, because it's so far away. Uh, that's, uh, that's an excellent question, by the way. That means you're thinking about it. Um, uh, the galaxies are rotating, but what happens is that because they're so far away, we do not see the rotation. If you if you stare at that galaxy for thousands of years, you will find it to be rotating. But they are so far away that it's, it's not possible for you to. Ro- we cannot see the rotation. So, so uh, I have one also that, that which is the keen observer satellite. Is there? I'm sorry. Say it again. So, uh, what is the very keen observer means? Uh, satellite or aircraft is there? Uh, I didn't follow it. He means uh, what is the highest resolution 
of earth observing satellite or okay so okay so it's about 30 35000 kilometers above the earth they are called geo geostationary satellites okay sir so after our education if we got interest in this field so how can we interact with you um i'll i'll give chintamani my email address you you're welcome to email me and when you email me tell me that you were in this talk and i'll definitely um, answer your email now remember i get a lot of emails i may not be able to do it in the next day or two but i will answer your questions uh, if you have any questions you're welcome to email me okay sir thank you maybe sir can i ask yes, sir, thank you can i ask you yes. crash turn yeah. into planet no let's hold on someone asked a question before chintamani was it you yeah so can stars yeah. turn into a planet uh, no no the definition of a planet is actually going an object going around the star so a star cannot be a planet so what will be black hole will collapse Hmm? So what will happen if black hole will collapse? When the once a black hole collapses, we have no idea what's going on there. Uh, we don't have the Hi, technology sir. to understand. We don't have the technology to understand what go what happens once a black hole collapses. What's inside a black hole? We don't know. So can you tell me about Olympus Mons? About? Can tell me, someone tell me what it is? I didn't. Uh, yeah, maybe any any teachers. Uh... Yeah, I have one question. Does aliens are there in this space? Ah, uh, no. Uh, so let's look at it this way. Um, I believe that there should be aliens somewhere else. Okay. but i have no evidence for it um can someone let me in i just um, got my computer booted up so can you just uh, let sir in yes yes so you're in now i mean okay let me get leave this one here okay uh the student was asking for olympus moons olympus, olympus moons yeah let me answer the alien yeah. question first um The alien question is that yes, aliens. Do. I believe the two things. One is believe, one is evidence. I believe there should be life form elsewhere in a galaxy or the galaxies, but there is no evidence for it. Okay. So Hello, all the stories you hear about aliens on the earth, I don't think are true. So and then to answer the question of Olympus Mons. Olympus Mons is a is a extinct volcano on Mars. It's the tallest mountain in in a solar system. But it's an extinct mountain. It's called what is called a shield volcano. It's like the volcanoes you have in Hawaii. Um, not. Sir, you have muted yourself. Sorry, uh, sir. Uh, Can you unmute? Wait, 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 wait. wait. I think uh, that is uh, my mistake. Wait, huh? I'll just unmuting him. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Sorry. Okay, okay. So the question was, Olympus Mons, as I said, is actually a, a tallest volcano in the solar system. Um, um, it's what is called a shield volcano. It's not because of two tectonic plates coming together like the Himalayas and forming a mountain. We are from lava which solidified. Uh, so this is the tallest mountain in the solar system, but it's extinct. There's there's no lava there. Any other question? Uh, maybe I okay. can ask. Hello, sir. Ask, ask, ask. It's Chanod. Hello, Nanda. I have one question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sir. You said you believe that aliens, a uh, life form, must be present somewhere, right? But right. isn't that a uh, bad news for humanity, considering the Great Filter and Fermi's paradox? Well, it depends how you look at it, right? It's Pardon? up to you to believe it. So you can say that yeah, the aliens might. You know, it's better not to 
have contact with the aliens because um, they can be destructive. Right? Exactly, they can be destructive, and they can. But they can also us. be. They, they can also be very um, um, uh, helpful. We don't know that, so um, I believe that we should we should figure out a way to see whether we are alone or not. Take the chance. Um, I, I I believe that if there were aliens and if they wanted to destroy us, they would have destroyed us by now. Okay, and here's another thing, you know, um, aliens, you know, they, they might not find us very interesting. Um, if you if you ever ever heard uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, this is, this is his word, so I'm not taking responsibility for it. But what he has said that if you look at the DNA of humans and the DNA of chimpanzees on the earth. There's only a difference of 4%. But even with that difference of 4%, humans have built telescopes, have built spacecrafts. So imagine a DNA of an ant, okay? We are going to ignore ants because we don't think it causes any problems. So to a um, alien, if their DNA is a little more than, um, uh, than us in comparison, uh, in terms of similarity, they might think that we are insignificant. And they might not contact us. Or may, there might be alien life forms underneath oceans, and they, we haven't contacted them. So yes, uh, you know, we take the risk. But wouldn't it be exciting to know that we are not alone in the solar system? Okay, maybe uh, can I ask a question, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, sir, go ahead. I want to ask uh, two questions. Uh, one is uh, being here because, as you said, that something some initiatives should happen from Mumbai region. Uh, right. So how we can think uh, uh, from Muktangan point of view and overall students uh, in Mumbai, how we can go about uh, any such projects where, uh, you know, where students get opportunities to work on launching balloons or even making a satellite. Because I feel, uh, because uh, another background is uh, in 8 to 10 standard, Maharashtra government has introduced space in their syllabus and with the new education policy coming into the picture, we might expect more uh, uh, exposure which should be given to space. Uh, so what do you think and uh, do we expect any India-US collaborations in future space missions? You know? Yeah, yes, the, the, there will be collaboration for 100%. That's the only way to survive. It's going to happen. But let's take baby steps, okay? So um, there are a number of things that we can do, say, to involve students from, from your uh, organization. Um, and they don't have to actually launch anything to space right now. We can start slowly. Um, launching in space requires someone who is very um, enthusiastic, has contacts, because it's, it's India, right? You need contacts. You need money to do it. The government will give, won't give you the funds, so you need private sources to give you the funds. Uh, so there are a number of things we can do. Um, there are a number of, uh, of global um, uh, um, challenges that students can take part, but it costs money. So let's just give you an example. We just uh, did this two days ago. It's, it's a new challenge called Plant the Moon Challenge. Have you heard about it? No, so the plant the moon challenge is in our university, we have a lab called the Excellence Lab and we are creating simulants of soils in other planets. So we have lunar simulants, we have Martian simulants, asteroid simulants. So in this challenge, plant the moon challenge, we are giving lunar simulants to any teams and we're challenging them to grow plants using that lunar simulant. So it's very similar to the uh, to the soil that you can find on the moon, on the highlands of the moon, not the lowlands. And then you have to add nutrients to it because there are no nutrients in the simulants. You can do any plants you want to grow and you have 10 weeks to grow certain plants. So that costs about $300. So if you have $300, then we can ship the, uh, because it costs uh, money to make that, um, challenge. But there are other things that you can do where it doesn't cost money and we can brainstorm over that. But there are things that the, that the students can do on small scale. I, I, I call them um, uh, crawl, walk, run, fly. Okay. You can do the crawl by doing simple experiments. You can do the 
walk by launching it on a weather balloon, or you can also do it by putting on rockets. And as three of us said, uh, you know, they're putting satellites on on um, uh, on on uh, on Israel rockets. But I, from my point of view, I don't want to get caught up in these things that we have been the first one to do this, or we are. The, you give them an opportunity for the students to take part in a group project, make a connection to an organization, um, and that's all you need. It does not have to go and orbit the Earth. And one thing the student should learn is, this is my point of view, okay? I could be totally different than anyone else. It's not bother with all the objectives, like I'm the first to do this, the 100 people have run. No, you do it because you like to do it, um, and you'll be successful. And if you follow that path, there are a number of projects we can do. And doesn't have to be expensive. So we can have a brainstorm session with you and the other teachers. And let's do step by step where they can do simple things. There's so much data that we have that students can work on. Uh, I'm so sure if somehow we can work on getting uh, those uh, soil uh, simulants. And if students get opportunity to even work on these kind of interdisciplinary projects. You know? Right, so this is totally different, yes. right? This is growing plants, agriculture. Um, Correct. Um, so um, the, um, uh, there's going to be a new one beginning in the summer, a new okay. program. This is already started. So I'll okay. keep you involved. Um, um, so I'll give you the, I'll give you the uh, URL. You can see what's going on right now. Um, okay. And then uh, if there's a way that you can get $300 from some donors and you can get about 10 kilograms of the soil and you can break it up a number of teams in your group and they start growing different kinds of plants to see how tall they can grow. Yeah, right. so yeah, so that that's one thing. I just remembered it because we just did it two days ago. Uh, so that can be done and it's open. There are teams from Korea, from Turkey uh, and so on taking part in this challenge. So we can FedEx the um, um, soil to you. There's no issue about uh, foreign students being involved because there's no ITAR issues because there's no technology being involved. It's very simple to do. Right. Uh, so one more question I have, since uh, most of these students, they are from 8 to 10 standard and we know that uh, education in India is more memory oriented and it lacks in hands-on uh, activities. So uh, uh, what is your advice to students if they want to pursue careers in space and how they should go about overall learning these sciences, learning okay. mathematics, physics, because I think uh, many of us, we are more uh, caught up in rat race of entrances uh, and, you know, getting into competitive careers. But overall, if they want to build up their career, what should be uh, your advice to students? So, uh, can you see my, see my screen? Yes. Okay, so, um, hold on. Look at this, and I can, I can send it to you. Look at all these occupations that you can do um, just because you want to do space exploration to begin with. Um, you can do management, okay? A computer and mathematics. Um, architecture and engineering. I said architecture because you need to design now settlements on the moon, on Mars and elsewhere. Um, um, uh, you can be uh, sciences, animal scientists, astronomers, atmospheric scientists, biology and so on. Uh, education, we need teachers, engineering teachers, computer science teachers and so on. So there are so many things that you can do to be a part of the space exploration. And then if you look at some of the uh, education that you need to do, if you want to be an astronomer or sciences, I would say it's good to get a doctoral degree, you know, with a bachelor's degree and stuff. But to be an engineer, you know, I think if you get a bachelor's degree or in India, at least a master's because it's very competitive, then, you know, aerospace engineers, computer science, electronics, mechanical, we need all of them to, to be a part of the space exploration. Another thing people tend to forget is technicians. I think they're more important than the engineers and the scientists. We, at least in India, we need to focus on technicians. Um, it could be a two year program after, call, after school. And I know they only do it in India, but you know, aerospace technician, avionics, um, 
life science, physical science technician. So these are kind of technical degrees. All of all the students don't want to go and become a scientist or become an engineer. They don't have to, but here's another option for them. And then of course, media and communication, that's the biggest thing, unfortunately. Uh, but you know, you can be <laughs> photographers, technical writers, um, uh, public, publication relations specialists. So whenever you form a, a team to just something, you have someone who can write a story, someone with an art, with an English background or Marathi background, doesn't have to be any language, could be any language. You need someone who can say, who has, who's creative enough to draw, make, come up with a logo and come up with artist conception. And then people who can make movies out of it. So it's not restricted just to science and engineering. It also goes to arts and so on. So uh, engineering fields of studies, you want to be an engineer, whether it's in India, whether it's here, uh, aerospace and aeronautical engineering, instrumentation engineering, computer science, material science, mechanical, robotics, spacecraft, telecommunication, biomedical. So what you have to decide is what you would like to do. Okay, of course you can't do all of them, right? So you, you go to your first year in engineering, you learn the basics, but then you decide, hey, I want to build robots. So you go to robotic engineering or oh, no way. I want to be able to build a spacecraft or a rocket or the materials in the spacecraft. Then you do mechanical engineering, materials engineering. So it all depends what you would like to do. And then you can go to any one of these fields to do it because we require uh, students from all these fields for the future of space exploration. And then sciences, you know, it's, you know, everything is driven by science and then the engineering comes in. So, astrophysics, biology, chemists, uh, doctors and medical scientists, that is very important. We want to study the effect of space travel on the human body, a geologist, physicist, um, and then technology as I said, uh, communication technicians, CAD operators, drafters, electricians, laser technicians, that is going to be a big thing. Um, additive manufacturing, you know, using 3D printing. That is something I think you guys in Space Geeks and Mukta can, can focus on is additive manufacturing. A laser print is not very expensive to do. So that's one thing you can focus on. Um, and then where can you work as a space scientist in India at least? Uh, okay, you have ISRO, you have the Defense Research and Development Organization, you have Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. This is a government organization. You have the National Aeronautical Lab, and then you have aerospace. You have a number of new aerospace companies coming up in India. Um, and of course, space scientists can work in universities. Um, they can write proposals and, and, get, and get funding. So there are options open both for engineers and scientists. Observatories, science museums, there are other places where astronomers can work. There are R&D centers, military operations where space scientists and engineers can work. And then if you look at the ISRO Satellite Center, the Liquid Propulsion System Center, NSRA Space Application Center, they also offer research opportunities for space scientists. So believe it or not, when I was growing up in India, there was no opportunity at all. But right now it is mushrooming in India. So ISRO has a number of centers. These are all the centers that ISRO has in India. There's a number of them that you can actually go and work for. ISRO has changed a, a, a lot over the last five years. They're more open to students working with them. So you don't have to come and work at NASA all the time. You know, right in your home ground, you have ISRO, you have other companies working and you can of course work over there. Um, there's some autonomous bodies. Um, there's a physical research lab of the Northeast Space Application Center, Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology and so on. So there are so many other bodies that we can sit and work later on. To give you an example, here, here look at all the ISRO centers uh, all over the nation, you know. Almost every state has something. So, uh, you know, in Mumbai, there is something uh, in Kolkata, in, in Assam. <coughs> so the future is very bright. And you just have to decide what you want to do. Uh, if you decide what you want to do right now, then you can, you can, um, uh, focus on what you want to study in, in, in college. And you know, the students are always welcome to write to me if they have questions about, about what they want to do, or if they have questions about science and engineering, 
Um, you know, I can't answer all of them, but I can get the answers for you. Uh, okay, so there are uh, 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 many questions. Uh, there is one question from Drone Jayaswal. Sir, mm -hmm. why do you why do space rockets use pure fuel? Why not radioactive energy, nuclear energy, or solar energy? So, uh, um, that's a good question. Very, very good question means you're thinking. Um, the problem is what we call the gravity well of the Earth. Okay, There's so much gravity on the Earth that to overcome gravity using solar energy is not good enough. We don't have the technology to harness the solar energy into something that we can use to launch something from the earth. Once we are beyond the main effect, main effect of gravity from the earth, then we can switch to solar energy, nuclear energy, and so on. The other the problem is on the earth, you cannot focus too much on nuclear energy. So for example, um, where I live, I live about 20 miles from Kennedy Space Center, okay? They're launching rockets um, with chemical fuel. But these rockets actually go over the ocean. When they launch, they don't go over the land. That's why we have all these uh, launch centers on the ocean, whether it's in India, whether it's in other countries. Or if you have it on land, it'll be like in Russia, middle of nowhere. So imagine that the main fuel is nuclear fuel to launch a rocket. Something goes wrong and the rocket explodes. What's going to happen to all the surrounding population? They'll be radiated with all this nuclear radiation. You can't afford to have that. So we are, unfortunately, we are still um, worried. We still have to use uh, chemical um, fuels right now, but they are working on alternate fuel solutions so that we can launch from the earth uh, using uh, other types of fuel. But right now we are still focused on, on chemical fuels. Now, unless you go to the moon and then launch from the moon, we have less gravity, then it is, you can use the other type of fuels. And remember something, in a rocket launch, 5% of the weight of the, of, the, of the rocket is the payload. 95% is the fuel because we're using chemical fuels. Okay, 95%. So we cannot carry, suppose you're going to the space station, you cannot carry too much water with you, too much of materials with you because that increases the weight of the payload, which increases the weight of the rocket, which means more fuel, which means more expensive. Um, to it to launch. So we are limited. So we have to use, unfortunately, I couldn't talk to you about that, but we have to use the resources on the moon or on the other planets to survive. For example, I talked about this lunar simulant. So on the moon, we call it the regolith or the soil. It's very fine powder. We can use that to, for cement. Okay. And then you use 3D printers to create the framework and then you can put the cement on the framework to, to block the radiation. You can use the re lunar regular to extract water and oxygen. And you can use the lunar regular to grow plants. So we're using the resources of that, of that object to further your technology. Uh, I think there was a question on uh, YouTube. Uh, that says like, if a human goes on Mars, then can they affect the life which is on Mars, assuming that there is life there? Yeah, go, again, that's a good question. So one, one very important thing that at least in NASA we think about is that if you are going to another planet, okay, whether it's Mars and you, you do not contaminate that planet with, with bacteria from the Earth or with, with something from the Earth. So whenever you send spacecraft to this planet, they're actually sterilized. Some of them gold plates. So they're very careful that we're not carrying any bacteria, but you still carry them. You, we, we have taken bacteria to, the, to, to, the, to Mars in a very small scale, we have. So you're right. So if humans go to Mars, I think first it's very important to figure out, is there some kind of bacterial life form on Earth or on Mars? If there is, then we have to figure out the ways to, um, to isolate ourselves so we do not contaminate that. So that's why I think, you know, just thinking of going to Mars or to another object, it's not that easy. There are ethical things to worry about. Um, in fact, there is a professor in, in Florida, uh, and we have supported his projects. One of the things that he does is he has a Martian chamber, 
uh, in his lab, which mimics the Martian atmosphere. And he's studying the effects of, of, this, of the Martian atmosphere on different bacteria on the Earth. And he has studied about 30, 31 bacteria, and he has found one or two which can survive Martian conditions. So if this bacteria do go uh, from, from the Earth to Mars, it will contaminate the Martian. Yes. And gentlemen, one thing I've thought about that we can do for your students is, and I don't know, I have to talk with these researchers, for example, this guy, Maybe we can do a ten you know, a number of feeds, maybe a ten minute feed from his lab, where he talks to the students and shows you the Martian chamber and the work that he's doing. Um, there's another lady who I'm working with. She's sending squids uh, to the International Space Station, small baby squid, and the idea is to see that how does bacteria interact with the human beings when it's in outer space in microgravity. So we know that we have good bacteria inside a human, inside a body, like in a stomach, which helps us digest. Now, what will happen to the bacteria if it goes and stays in microgravity for a long time? Does it make a bad bacteria? So this touch, she's studying the effects of these uh, uh, bacteria on the squid. So what they do in a small test tube, they put the squid, in another test tube, they put the bacteria. Once it's in the space station, they'll mix it together and then you'll see the effect of the bacteria on the squid. So I might be able to get a few people to talk to your students for 10, 15 minutes. Um, um, uh, the main problem is the time difference. You know? uh, that, that causes the major problem. But maybe we can do that and they can learn more about what's being done here, at least in Florida, um, for space exploration. That's a great idea, sir. We will look into it and definitely we will want to take advantage of that. And our students will be able to learn so much because they right. are learning about bacteria and everything, what's going on with the disease and all, diseases and all. So, right. uh, yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you, sir. Can we Another take question? more questions? There are quite a few on YouTube. Can we send, uh, Chintamani, can we send these questions? Because a lot of students, I think they are using their parents' uh, mobiles and all. So I think we will compile all the questions and send it to sir. Or we can have these small meetings if it's okay with sir. Then we can yeah, yeah, take it yeah. forward. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you want to have another uh, session with the students, just question answers, we can do it. Um, yeah, that will be, a, that's a great idea. And I think we will um, uh, talk it over among ourselves and then we will let you know. And according to your convenience, then we'll set up a time. Yeah, we can just do a question answer session and, and let them be so I can see the face also. That's very important. Yes. We can interact that way. Yeah. Okay, huh. so that will be entirely question answer based. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So we have anything else, uh, Chintamani? Are you there? I think he's on the phone with someone. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, you're muted, Chintamani. Michelle, meanwhile, any other uh, question uh, until Chintamani returns? Could you please check? Uh, yes, uh, one second. So there are many questions in the chat. Um, so Kesar Singh, can I request Kesar Singh to unmute and ask the question? Uh, it's about uh, red shifts and blue shifts. Yeah, am I, am I audible now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Maybe uh, what we can do is we can uh, uh, select all these questions and I will mail it to Jaydeep sir. And uh, uh, so uh, before we conclude with this event, I again thank Dr. Jaydeep Mukherjee, Director NASA FSJC, who uh, took out his valuable time to um, give us the whole idea about what is space exploration is all about and what are the opportunities for students and i'm i'm sure you all of you must have got inspired 
by uh, attending this talk and i'm sure uh, he continues this uh, uh, he continues be with us guiding us and what different kind of space projects we can do and uh, i'm sure that uh, you will all be inspired and encouraged to take up higher studies related to space and as we know that uh, there will be opportunities in the indian space sector which is growing and space sector in itself is a global uh, has a global outlook and uh, there will be opportunities all over the globe to be a part of uh, this expanding space sector and uh, i also thank muktangan officials uh, to always encourage us to continue with this space talks and uh, with that uh, we will conclude this section uh, this session and thank you once again dr jaydeep mukherjee and uh, uh, we'll have again such a interactive session with more uh, focused topics related to space yeah i apologize for the technical difficulties but that's a part of using technology um, it does not bother me uh, but it's too bad that i couldn't show you some of the um, other uh, parts of the moon but we can have another talk about that later on um but right. i'll i'll gladly talk to the students anytime you want um just to worry about the time difference that's it but uh, you can yeah. have more than one session to talk to them and yes we definitely will sir ha huh. michelle please go ahead yeah yeah so uh, uh dr mukherjee on behalf of uh, the muktangan science team staff and students i would like to thank you for um Uh, making time to conduct this uh, talk with us uh, this topic on space exploration and careers related to it intrigues everyone especially oh, our uh, muktangan kids so uh, i'm glad we could connect with you digitally for this session today and looking forward for more uh, talks uh, and uh, like a webinar with you so we would love to have that because our students have a lot of questions Yeah. Yes, I I see the chat now. It's very interesting questions. Now, sir, we can go on and on all night. Yeah, no. yeah. Send send it to me. Uh, I'll I'll try and I'll try and uh, try and answer by email. That's a lot of work actually answering by email. In fact, I will answer some of them. And those who are, whose emails have not been answered, they can ask me the questions. Uh, this session was so yeah. successful. I mean, uh, we were almost house full. and i was logged out because of internet uh, problems and i i myself had problems logging in so thank you very much sir for such an inspiring talk yes. and uh, uh, with that uh, we conclude this session and we look forward uh, having more such sessions with muktangan and with jaydeep sir thank you all and uh, let us meet for next space talk soon and thank you chintamani and the whole space geeks team uh because of you this was possible we really appreciate all your help and again jaydeep sir thank you and we are looking forward to many more sessions like this and thank you all the guests all the students teachers colleagues everybody for joining in thank you so much have a nice evening bye 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 sir bye